Thank you, Dan. Yeah. I'd like a little bit of an answer. Just kind of really. But this is where it's at. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than live in the tents of wickedness. Where have you been? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it is great to see you here in the sanctuary uh, this day. And for those of you who uh, are on the internet in terms of Facebook Live, uh, we greet those of us who are on the internet on Facebook Live. And it's great to see you who are here in the sanctuary this day. Uh, those of you in the sanctuary have figured out or someone has helped you master the reservation system. We are limited at this point to a little less than uh, 70 persons, so uh, we need you to make reservations if you plan to be with us next Sunday. Each week we'll need you to make those reservations. Once we reach that area around 65, it'll cut off uh, in terms of available seats that we're allowed to use at this point in time. 
So again, this week, sign up, plan to be with us this Sunday. Uh, it's simple enough. You simply go to www.stmarkhamilton.org. Again, that's S-A-I-N-T, St. Hamilton, St. Mark Hamilton.org. At the top of the page will be a red bar which says for attendance, click here. Guess what you do? Click there. <laughs> click there. Okay, easy enough. Go to the next page and ask you to ask for your 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock worship services. Uh, but again, you're here, so you have mastered the system. <laughs> A necessary announcement, charge conference. Uh, will happen on October 27 at 7 p.m. via Zoom. All members of the Administrative Council, please note the date. The link will be sent to you as soon as we receive it. All Saints service is Sunday, November the 1st. In addition to the Lord's Supper, we will be recognizing members and friends of St. Mark who have died since November 2019. If you're a next of kin to a member or a friend who has died this year, please send to us to the church office a photo of that person or an electronic image so that we can remember your loved ones in our act of remembrance that day. Friends, thank you for your understanding in advance. Uh, thank you for wearing your mask today. Thank you for seeking to keep six feet apart from one another. We're a little not so good at doing that, except in the grocery store. Um, and your concern for each other. Thank you for uh, taking on inconvenience in order to care for other people. That's part of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, so, uh, thank you for sitting in the designated areas. We know it's not where you're used to sitting. We ask that you do not sing the hymns. You are, certainly can hum the hymns. Or you can do your favorite Billy Vanilli impression and lip sync the hymns. Um, when service is over, this day will ask you to leave the sanctuary as quickly as you can so our custodians can uh, sanitize uh, the sanctuary uh, for this week. So again, thank you for your cooperation. Please do not congregate in the narthex. If you see someone you need to talk to, and I know that there are those folks you need to talk to, do so outside where you can handle the six feet distance more easily than in the very narrow markets. We know this is different for all of us, but not even these inconveniences can keep us from worshiping our Lord. And we do so at this time.
you join in our call to worship, that you'll be able to follow on the screen. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies, the skies declare God's, God's handiwork. The day pronounces God's glory without a sound. The, the night expounds God's knowledge without a word. And yet their voice goes throughout all the earth. Let us join our voices with the voice of creation in declaring God's glory. And our hymn is Jesus Shall Reign. I invite you to hum or follow along with the words on the screen. And if you're at home, sing with gusto. <laughs> <laughs> of your Son. We have persecuted others out of ignorance and willful misunderstanding. Help us forsake our pride like Paul before us, that we might put our faith and trust in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We now invite you to join a time of silent confession. One who created us seeks us still and beckons us towards the heavenly goal of union with Christ. Seek God and know that our sins are forgiven. We now join in that prayer which Jesus called, saying, Our Father, Father 
Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
at 4b and continuing through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and regard them as rubbish in order that they may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, for I have already reached, or that I have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining towards what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. It is, okay. I will sing more home to know you more.
to see all of you out here uh, this day. And to finally come back together in this sanctuary uh, in worship, we give God thanks uh, for a day that we wondered how long it would be till it ever came. But thanks be to God that we're here this day. But I've also learned uh, some things uh, over the past number of months, and that is that um, we can come together and worship like this, but there's other ways in which we can share worship together. You see, what I've learned is, is I've become technological. Um, believe that, and I'll tell you something. Um, but what I've learned is that um, Becky, thank you, Becky, um, Becky's here with a magic box. And somehow there's people in there. And, and when we come to worship, they're in there joining us in worship. Uh, this week we made the commitment that from this point on, that we are still every Sunday going to post online one if not two of our worship services. We figured that if folks who came here could choose between contemporary and traditional, they also be able to choose uh, on the internet whether they want to follow the feed that's either traditional or contemporary. But we have made a commitment that those of you who are able to be here on Sunday, we celebrate you. Those who are not yet able to be with us for one reason or another, they'll be able to follow us and join us in worship over Facebook Live. Thanks be to God that uh, even an old guy can learn new things. You may remember the 1950s song written by Phil Spector. It was inspired by an etching on his father's tombstone, which said, to know him is to love him. The song was famously sung by the teddy bears and afterwards by Peter and Gordon, the Beatles, Nancy Sinatra, Martina McBride, Donny, Dolly Parton, Emmy Lou Harris, Linda Ronstadt, on and on and on. And they all sang, to know, know, know him is to love, love, love him. Jeremy Troxler tells of the historic legend of the Greek runner messenger, Phaedipes. It is argued that the word marathon comes from this legend of Phaedipides. Around 490 BC, a great Persian army landed on the plain of Marathon, threatening the city of Athens just 25 miles away. Athens prepared for a battle that could threaten their civilization. But against all odds, the outnumbered Athenian army defeated the Persian army in battle. It was an unbelievable, unexpected kind of victory. So after the battle, a runner named Pheidippides was dispatched to carry news of victory to the fearful citizens of Athens. Pheidippides ran the 25 miles across the plain of Marathon to Athens without once stopping for an energy drink or a potty stop, and there were no fans cheering him on. When he arrived exhausted, dehydrated, saturated with sweat and panting, Pheidippides burst into the city assembly, and with his last breath he shouted, Rejoice! We conquered. Rejoice! We conquered. Centuries later, the poet Robert Browning argued, that Pheidippides, who died that day, died with a smile on his face, that his heart gave out from pure euphoria at the victory, from overwhelming happiness at reaching his destination, 
from ecstatic joy at sharing good news with the people he loved. In our scripture from Philippians, Paul envisions his life as an arduous marathon. From prison, he writes as though he was a runner, feeling the burn in his legs, hitting the wall, straining with all that it was in him to break the tape at the finish line. He writes, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. For a significant part of his life, Paul was searching for God. Although early on, he was searching for the followers of Jesus in order to eliminate them. He was running for another purpose, running for a different prize. Paul, for much of his life, strove for religious success. He wanted to be holy. He strove to be good. He wanted to follow God's law. He trained, and by outward measures, he succeeded. I mean, Paul's curriculum vitae was impressive. His resume was astounding. Then one day on the Damascus Road, he stopped chasing Jesus. And Jesus started chasing him. Paul was forced to admit that throughout all of his life, he'd been running the wrong way. Those of you who are sports fans might remember how in 1964, Minnesota Vikings defenseman lineman Jim Marshall scooped up a fumble by a San Francisco 49ers wide receiver and headed towards the end zone. No one wearing the opposing team's uniform stood in the way of Marshall and a touchdown. So he took off running as fast as a big defensive lineman could go, dashing in his purple helmet, purple pants, and white jersey as dreams of a touchdown danced in his head. He heard the crowd yelling at him. He hardly noticed his teammates running down the sidelines, waving their arms at him. He cruised the last few yards into the end zone and celebrated by taking the ball and throwing it into the crowd. Then something strange happened. A player from the other team came up to him and gave him a big hug. Marshall finally realized that he'd gone to the wrong end zone and he had just scored two points for the 49ers. When you watch the television replay of this event, the announcer is screaming, he's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong way. The only person in the stadium that did not know Marshall was running the wrong way was Jim Marshall. Despite a 20-year football career and being part of the renowned Purple People Eaters, Marshall has been known as Wrong Way Marshall. In our scripture this day, Wrong Way Paul recounts the day in which he came to realize that his whole life had been running the wrong way. Everything he'd worked for, everything he had committed himself to, all of the things he was so proud of that he had identified success was misguided. He goes so far in this passage that he states that he counts it all as garbage. 
Now, now think of the image of putting all the things that once mattered to you and wrapping them in a trash bag. Putting it out to the curb and watching sanitation workers toss it in the truck. Never to be seen or thought of again. Paul has found that which is of surpassing value that nothing can measure up to. He has encountered the pearl of great price as described in the Gospels that is of such great beauty, value, and worth that a person would and should sacrifice everything to attain it. All that he ever thought of as valuable pales in importance and value to that greatest treasure, the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Paul echoes the words of the African-American spiritual. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. But give me Jesus. For years, every confirmation cycle, we talk to the young people about the difference between knowing and knowing about. We did this by listing things that we knew about George Washington, and we start to list those things, and the kids would know, you know, he was our nation's first president, was married to Martha, fought in the Revolutionary War. And then when they ran out of those things, we then stretched it a little bit and said, well, there's still lots more that you know about George Washington, and they said, we don't know anything more about George Washington. And we'd remind them they know George Washington never used a cell phone. We knew that George Washington was not an Eagles or a Giants fan. If they had football at that time, he would probably be a Patriots fan. We knew that George Washington didn't drive stick shift. Once we came up with an impressive list, the young people were impressed with how much we knew about George Washington. But do we really know him? What was his greatest heartache? What brought him the greatest joy in life? What was his favorite dessert? What one thing would he do over again if given the opportunity? We we don't know. To know the answer to these questions, we'd have to know George rather than knowing about George. To be able to answer this last set of questions, we'd need to have a relationship with George Washington. We'd have to ask him. Wrong way, Paul is talking here about knowing, not knowing about Christ. Paul long ago knew about God. He knew about the law. He knew what it meant to be a person of faith. But knowing about is not the same as knowing. In this passage, Paul talks about knowing in terms of having an intimate relationship with Christ. This relationship with Christ takes precedence over everything else that was important, everything that would seem to be important now, and anything that would ever be important in his life. Paul confesses that this relationship with Christ is in process. While Paul has a new prize that he's striving for, he's not already experienced the fullness of relationship with Christ. So he writes, not that I have already obtained or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own. Matt Emmons had the gold medal in sight. 
He was one shot away from claiming victory in the 2004 Olympic 50-meter three-position rifle event. He did not need to hit a bullseye in order to win. He just needed to be on the target. Normally, the shot he made would have earned him a score of 8.1, more than enough for him to win the gold medal. But in what was described as an extremely rare mistake in elite competition, Emmons fired at the wrong target. Standing in lane two, he fired at the target in lane three. His score for a good shot at the wrong target was zero. Instead of the gold medal, Emmons ended up in eighth place. Take it from wrong way, Paul. Take it from wrong way, Bob. There's only one target for our lives, one prize to strain for, and that's knowing Christ. Experiencing a relationship with God in Christ that grows and develops and deepens with each new day. To know, know, know him is to love, love, love him. And we do. Most gracious and glorious God, we give you thanks for the high privilege that we have of coming to this place. We will not take this place for granted ever again. We won't take lightly the tremendous privilege we have of gathering with brothers and sisters in, in person or over the live stream. We thank you, most gracious God, for the glory of this day. And yes, in order to care for one another, we're not singing with our voices. But Lord, you hear our hearts. We come unto you this day, and Lord, we pray for the President of the United States and for anyone everywhere who has been affected with coronavirus. Lord, we pray soon that a vaccine might be found. For Lord, there are too many in our world who grieve the death of loved ones because of this virus. And we pray, most gracious God, that you offer your strength and your comfort to those who grieve. Lord, we pray for our nation as we approach uh, a, a, a time in which we could do elections. We ask, most gracious God, that you might work to raise up those who would give leadership to this nation and who might help us to care for all. Most gracious and glorious God, we offer thanks to you for ways in which we can learn to do ministry that even months ago we hadn't thought of. Help us as a church to reach out and to care and to express your love to all. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, part of the uh, celebration of the past number of weeks is the faithful giving of uh, members and friends of this congregation uh, to where we have been able to do some things in ministry because of the generosity of persons who are associated with this congregation, whether it's uh, those who are here today or those who are on Facebook Live. Uh, we are, are thankful for your faithfulness and give God thanks for you. If you've been gotten used to giving through uh, your bank drafts, well, please continue to do that. 
if you've become used to using the conference credit card option and you like that, well, please continue to give in that way. Those of you who've mailed in hundreds of envelopes, if that's how you're comfortable, please give in that fashion. Um, or if you come every Sunday and you place your envelope in the plate, thanks be to God for you, please continue to use that fashion. As you give, we offer them in service unto God, seeking to use the gifts which you give for ministry in this place and throughout the world. Now, again, we're trying to care for one another. If there are things you don't agree with, feel free to talk to me about that. I'll be glad to do that. Just understand the intention. Today, as you go out this door, this door, this door, there's an offering plate if you'd like to leave your offering there. We're not going to pass the plate uh, to one another for a number of reasons. Um, but as you leave, uh, those plates will be available if you uh, choose to make your offering. A word of thanks to those who make this service uh, possible. Um, Iris has been sitting through both services, helping us with the uh, slides and that kind of thing. We're thankful for that. Thanks for Bill and Sandy and Bill, who uh, provide help us to provide music, uh, and they help sing on our behalf. Um, and anyone else who's made this transition possible to where we celebrate uh, reopening this day. A uh, word for... Um, uh, Lorraine Wilson, who has spent hundreds of hours uh, working on the reopening document and that kind of thing. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. Thanks be to God uh, for you. In him, the church is one foundation.
day to sanitize the pews, etc. So uh, thank you for your presence and thank you uh, for your cooperation. Now here this benediction. Having been gathered from the world to receive God's word and to receive it with joy, I send you forth back in that very same world to be the church of Jesus Christ, proclaiming in word and deed that Jesus Christ is Lord.